I am thrilled to be here. I've had such a wonderful day visiting with um, the folks I met with and with trainees. And as Julie mentioned, I'll be talking about what we've learned from neuroscience about the adolescent brain. And this talk, or the topic for this talk, was um, motivated by um, some of what Julie mentioned about working with policymakers and legal scholars to, um, to think about what neuroscience brings to the table in terms of understanding adolescence. Um, and I'm today speaking uh, mostly about typically developing adolescents and, um, and how, we can, how we can best um, design structures and systems to support their develop development in a positive way. We know that brain development and the wave of plasticity that occurs early in life is necessary to support key developmental outcomes. Here I'm referring to uh, basic skills like walking and talking and bonding with caregivers. And in the past 15 years or so, um, a, a lot of which has been done with neuroscience and, and cognitive neuroscience in particular, we've learned that the adolescent brain also undergoes a, a, what's sometimes called as a second wave of plasticity to support their developmental outcomes and milestones. Um, and sometimes adolescents get a, a bad rap and there's a negative nar narrative around what adolescents need and what adolescents do. But if we think about the um, adaptive nature of the teenage brain, we can start to think about how better to support young people as they transition into and out of adolescence. Before I go on, I'll define what I mean by adolescence, and um, I'll say that there is actually no def definition for adolescence. All of you in the room, I'm sure, um, share the sentiment that although we know adolescence is a transition period between roughly um, 10 or 11 or 12, when, when, whenever pre puberty strikes, through the early 20s, um, we know that it is a time of, of growth, some say rapid growth, um, as we discover and learn from and adapt, and adapt is a key word here. But we know that it, it, it spans a long time, and so rather than simply thinking about it as a time that we need to get through or that, um, that, will, you know, that will pass, um, there's a lot of input that goes into shaping the developing brain. I also want to note with this slide that there are obviously distinct phases of adolescence. Early adolescence is quite distinct from late adolescence. And so in thinking about um, policies and programs that support young people, we need to consider those nuances as well. I'll talk about a few things um, in that support the notion that cognitive neuroscience has helped advance our understanding of the brain. And some of these I'll spend more time on um, and, and some a little bit less. But the first is that Identifying that adolescence is a distinct neurodevelopmental phase of life is something that has really occurred from a neurobiological perspective because of the tools we have with cognitive neuroscience. We now know that um, adolescents are not simply overgrown kids or many adults, but there are special things that happen in part because of the interactive nature of the hormones and the changing environment that occur during this time. You've probably all seen this image. Um, now it's almost, what, 20 years old. And it is um, one that is consistently shown because it illustrates something that is very pervasive and, and pretty well accepted in neuroscience. And that is that the brain continues to prune throughout, um, throughout early childhood and into early adolescence. What you're seeing, in case you're not familiar, is that as the brain gets more purple in this image, it represents um, the pruning process of, of gray matter volume. And it, that doesn't just happen ontogenetically, but happens in response to input. So if the adolescent is receiving, let's say, positive input, the, the brain will reflect, reflect that, as well as ad er, adversity, the brain will also reflect that. And it strengthens connections that support whatever is going on in that individual's environment. We also know that during this time, there's um, a, a great uptick in the connectivity uh, among adolescents, so that the, let's say, the front of the brain here um, is having increased myelination with the back of the brain. The reason that matters is that that supports speed of processing, um, interpreting information, action-oriented behavior, and all of that happens during the period of, uh, before adolescence, but certainly is refined during the period of what we consider adolescence. Some of the work I did when I worked with BJ Casey was to understand motivational systems in the brain. And surprisingly, even though there was a lot of, you know, kind of anecdotal 
information about adolescents and how they are reward-seeking and risk-taking, there was very little known about how the brain supports this seeming increase or um, exaggerated response to reward. So to study this, we, um, we did a very simple study in which we brought a group of adolescents, a group of kids, and a group of adults to the MRI. And we presented them with, with what we thought were um, attractive stimuli, money. Everybody likes money, and so we thought that would work. And so what we found, um, this is a schematic summarizing a lot of different studies and research. On the left, you'll see that participants of all ages um, exhibited robust activation of the ventral striatum, and in particular, the nucleus accumbens. And I'm sure you all know this is a very dopamine-rich region. And when we um, do a, a plot of that, we can see that although all age groups show this response in this dopamine-rich region, the adolescents show an exaggerated response. This study was, um, as I mentioned, done with the, the secondary re reward a reinforcer of money. And so we started getting a lot of questions about whether or not money simply meant something different to an adolescent as compared to an adult, for example. Maybe they, because they don't have money typically as compared to adults, they were, um, it, was, it was in and of itself more motivating. And so we thought about how to address this limitation and turn to the animal research on reward. And I'm sure you all know there's a very extensive literature on um, motivational systems in non-human animals. Um, this is a very classic one in which an, a, a monkey is presented with a stimuli that over time they learn is associated with a particular reward, which is a drop of juice or, or some other kind of appetitive primary reinforcer. So we aim to mimic this experiment in adolescence so we brought them to the lab and also hooked them up to um, straws and um, sh we used sugar water, salt water, and regular water as the neutral stimulus um, with the assumption that the sugar water would be the, the most appetitive. And it was, and I, I won't get into the details of all the, you know, some people don't like sugar, some people don't like salt and all that. We, we, we um, accounted for all of that. But what we found is, is what we predicted, that those who found the sugar water rewarding showed the same pattern of activation as they did with the money. And that is that the adolescents showed an exaggerated response as compared to the adults when they received the drop of sugar water. And we've since done this experiment with, with um, sugar water, we've done it with smiling faces, we've done it with attractive faces, you know, we've done it with a, a gamut of, of reward types and, and so have other labs around the world. And, and found very similar results, that there's something really special about the reward system during adolescence. And so the question is why? What does that serve the adolescent? And we can talk about that in Q&A. I argue that um, one thing it does is that it encourages paying greater attention to things that are good for you. That, that I should rephrase, things that you find pleasurable or joyous. Right. Sometimes that means engaging in behaviors that your parents may not be excited about, but it also means that it encourages you to form social relationships. It also means that it means you pursue sports even in the face of adversity or failure, right? Because you find it that rewarding. And so it makes sense that there's a period in our lives when we are drawn to rewards in a way that encourage our and motivate our behavior. We did find in other studies that um, individual differences in neural response to reward in the striatum as assessed during an fMRI task was associated with their self-reported real-life risk-taking behavior that included reckless driving, you know, other types of things that you might find, um, his, you know, characteristically risk-taking. Another thing that cognitive neuroscience has done is helped us understand that adolescence is more than just a, a, a defined by biology or puberty. So um, early research on adolescence focused exclusively on what many called raging hormones. We know that hormones are powerful, that there's an uptick in them during adolescence. And so the pendulum you know, was, really, was really focused on puberty and the effects of puberty, often in, in a negative light. And then with the advent of cognitive neuroscience, it really swung to focus on the brain, and obviously it's neither or, and the pendulum is starting to swing back to think about how puberty interacts with the normative changes in the brain to um, influence behavior. 
Um, here are some schematics from um, an article Ron Dahl published in 2018 in a, uh, as part of a collection of articles in the um, journal Nature. And if you haven't taken a look and you are interested in adolescence, I encourage you to, to look at this um, special issue that focus on, on a range of topics related to, to adolescence. But one thing that Ron and his colleagues focused on was one, illustrating obviously the many places that the hormones have an impact on the, on the body and the brain, the physical maturation, the behavioral changes, um, the brain obviously. And that the, the sex differences um, are really nicely illustrated here in terms of the physical growth between, um, the velocity of, of growth between males and females, and then obviously the, the hormonal changes. And so these two graphs, I think, illustrate one of the challenges that we've had in articulating how exactly puberty interacts with brain development in adolescence, in that both of these are very messy things to measure, and we often measure uh, puberty using um, the PDS, or the pubertal development scale or score. And although it, it's a proxy for, um, for puberty, it, it is imprecise in that we can't get you know, the level of detail that we know um, is necessary to fully understand the nuance of puberty and hormones. So I, I would say we have a lot of work to do there. Nevertheless, there's some research already that we know. So here is a review paper from Jen Pfeiffer's lab um, that nicely illustrates how, in particular, brain regions, um, whether there's an increase or a decrease in, in either tanner staging or testosterone or estradiol, there are um, different effects in, in terms of how that brain region is either functioning or characterized structurally. We also know that there are some um, sex differences in, in particular in the amygdala. So this is research done by, um, by uh, Elizabeth Sowell's group a, a few, you now it's about you know, a few years ago. Um, sh again, showing the relation between tanner staging and volume in the amygdala, and then an interaction between sex effects and tanner staging in, um, between boys and girls in the amygdala. And this is all to illustrate how important it is to consider the individual and sex differences when we examine um, puberty and, and, and um, adolescent development. Along the same lines, um, cognitive neuroscience has allowed us to think more carefully about individual differences. And any of you who are involved or use um, big data from several of the different consortia and um, efforts and initiatives around collecting a lot of data have allowed us to determine how factors such as environmental influence, um, you know, rearing environment, just normative individual differences can help us think about um, um, uh, policy implications for young people. I like to show this slide, and if you've seen me give a recent talk, I apologize for having shown this before, but I like it because it illustrates um, just how many individual differences there are. So this is an image I took when my nephew was a certain age and a certain grade. What grade and what age was he? They're all the same age and grade, by the way. Fifth grade, okay, what else? Seventh, how old are they? I thought you guys worked with kids. These, uh, you, all of you are wrong. So these, these people are, um, these kids are all eighth graders who are 14 years old. And I think it's really fascinating if, you know, this kid is quite distinct from this kid, right? He looks like he's in fourth grade and he looks like in his, he's in high school. And I illustrate this because obviously this is the result of differences in pubertal development. But thinking about how we treat people of a certain age, and this comes back to the, the ways that we, um, we treat adolescents or think about adolescents has a lot to do with how they look physically. And um, it has implications for, example, you know, uh, research or, or work in, in the juvenile justice system with how some young people may look older than they, than they, physic than they are um, because of their physical development. And that certainly has related to ethnic differences and, and such. This is also another illustration, and I don't expect you to see the details here, but um, more so to see, this is uh, work by Sh Sarah Jane Blakemore, showing the, um, you know, the, the patterns of, of brain development and the trajectories in these 
these brain regions that we often focus on when we're talking about reward-seeking behavior or memory or emotional behavior um, follow certain trajectories in boys and girls, but if you look closely, the individual differences are vast. And so that um, the, the big data has really helped us to take a look at that as well. And finally, um, just on the note of individual differences, the variability of brain maturation is as great within ages as, is, as it is between ages. This is a seminal paper published by Nico Dozenbach and, and Damien Fair in 2010, um, showing the, again, the trajectories are pretty similar among boys and girls when you average them, but when you look at them individually, there's, there's a lot of, of, of difference. This matters within the policy space and, and the legal scholar space because we often think of age as, as a proxy for maturation or cognitive ability, and yet um, it's an imprecise index of cognitive maturation and, and capacity, and, and, and we base a lot of our decisions on um, related to policy on, on age. The lab has been doing a lot of research on the relation between sleep and brain development, and I think it'll be of interest to all of you who study um, both typically and atypically developing adolescents. Sleep is, by, in some circles, considered a basic need that suffers during adolescence. And the reason for this is because although we have some um, recommended sleep duration times as uh, provided by the National Sleep Foundation, any of you who have an adolescent or who have been an adolescent know that during, during this time, you start to sleep less. And there are questions about why this happens. One is that there are circadian sleep delays related to puberty. And that happens because of this, I don't know if you can see it, but this tiny nugget of, of brain tissue here called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's here shown in purple. And it's the part of your brain that tells, you, that tells time for you. It's very sensitive to light, and so it is paying attention to when the sun sets and when the sun rises. And during adolescence, in response to pubertal hormones, its relationship with sunlight changes. One way it changes is that there are uh, differences in, in melatonin release. So most adults release melatonin when the sun starts to go down because the suprachiasmatic nucleus is paying attention to that. But once puberty, um, and individuals start to undergo puberty, melatonin is delayed in, um, the release of melatonin is delayed relative to older or younger people. And so it doesn't start to get, doesn't get released at sunset, but instead is maybe two or three hours later. So adolescents don't start to feel sleepy until later in the night. Obviously, there are changes in bedtimes and wake times and bedtimes, and this is one of those interactions with psychosocial factors. Um, parents start to, you know, give a little bit more autonomy to when their teens go to bed, and guess what? They don't go to bed as early as they do when they're, when, when they're younger. And technology use before bed is also obviously um, of, of increasing importance in this generation. What I think is a pretty striking image is this one from Mary Carskadden showing that although wake times remain the same in order to get to school, um, sleep times start to get later and later. And so the amount of time the adolescents are in bed or asleep is truncated by these psychosocial reasons. And later on, I'll show you some data where we determined you know, what exactly is causing this, this delayed sleep time in addition to the melatonin changes and, and the biological changes. Why we care about this is that sleep is associated with general health and well-being. We all know that. As adults, we know that when we don't get enough sleep, um, we, uh, we can't focus as well, we may have trouble reading others as well as we do when we do get enough sleep, paying attention is more challenging. And um, importantly for young people who may be struggling with other issues, there are important implications for emotional reactivity and regulation. In our adolescent samples, we can't really do sleep restrictive studies as they can in adults. But if you are interested in this in sleep restriction, um, Matt Walker at Berkeley has done a lot of great research in which he sleep deprives adults or college students, you know, for a day or two days, and then brings them to the lab and has them view either emotional images or do a risk-taking task or something like that. And what he finds is that in the sleep-deprived adults, 
They show greater reactivity in the amygdala in response to the same emotional faces that they see when they're not sleep deprived. And they also find greater risk taking behavior and engagement of the nucleus accumbens when they have been sleep deprived. These are in adults, or like I said, college students. So you can imagine that this is exacerbated, or you would predict that this is exacerbated in adolescents who are already undergoing um, these, um, these changes in the very brain regions that are the target for, uh, for sleep deprivation, that these regions are undergoing the most development, the prefrontal cortex, the, the um, mesolimbic systems, are also those that are most impacted by poor sleep. Um, based on this uh, context, we did a study funded by the William T. Grant Foundation, which is where I met Amanda. Um, I became very interested in sleep and had never done research on sleep, and they were very generous in, in allowing us to do this work. Um, a lot of it was done by Sarah Tajan, who also um, spent some time at UC Davis um, as, I think she was a volunteer here um, before she went to graduate school in my lab. None that, anyway, so this study was focused on understanding the sleep context under which young people um, are, are living their lives. Um, not just sleep duration, which we did collect with actograph watches, but also how um, the family context and narrative around sleep, um, the, the light in the room, the temperature in the room, their sleeping surfaces, how all of that played into the amount of sleep they were getting. So we did a home visit to determine those factors. They then wore an actograph and did daily sleep logs for us for two weeks. And then they came to the lab and got an fMRI scan where we took pictures of their brain while they did tasks related to risk taking and uh, cognitive control. We did a resting state scan. So we, we, you know, we, did, we did a lot of things with these kids to determine the interactive effects of sleep and, um, and these, in these behaviors we were interested in. One thing we found is that the, they averaged about seven hours of sleep, and that's normal for um, the US. But what caught our eye was not so much their sleep duration, which has um, had a lot of, of, of research um, on sleep duration, but here this variable that was the average number of awakenings. In other words, throughout the night, how many times were they waking up? And I don't mean wake up like they're going up, walking around and going to the bathroom, but Awakening, micro awakenings, whereby their brain is pain, is noticing that they're not getting restful sleep, but yet they may not notice it. And the average number was five, but um, the the range, if you note, was between you know less than one to over 22 times a night. That's a lot of time that you're not getting good sleep. And then the average duration of those awakenings was about 21 minutes, which is also quite a bit of time, um, but the, the range there was also quite striking. And so we dug into this a little bit more to determine how this sleep disruption um, was or was not linked to um, some connectivity analyses that we did, whereby we simply examined their um, uh, default mode network connectivity using resting state um, aspects of the scan. And what we found is that those who experienced greater sleep disruption, not as based on their own self-report, but based on the actograph watches, um, was linked to um, less connectivity in these brain regions that you can see here, including those in, in some frontal regions, some in um, some language regions, the insula, uh, ventral uh, medial prefrontal cortex. And here's a schematic of that, um, what we call the sleep disruption. So on the right, you're seeing that those with worse sleep had less of this um, default mode network connectivity. What we really care about is whether or not that's actually related to some of their, their behavior. So we, as I mentioned, we collected a battery of tasks on these young people. Um, here I'm going to show you some data we got from their impulsivity, uh, impulsive behavior. And we used um, the negative urgency, uh, uh, can't remember the exact, what all of it stands for, but it's an it's a, it's a impulsive, impulsivity score. And we mapped out whether there was a relation between sleep disruption and impulsivity. And uh, obviously we predicted that those who were getting less quality sleep had higher impulsivity. But there was an interaction also with their connectivity. So that those individuals who had, um, you know, what we called high connectivity, sleep didn't, whether or not they, they were sleep dysregulated or disrupted, didn't really have much of an impact on their impulsive scores. Um, this started to shift in those with the moderate connectivity. 
But those with low connectivity, so I'm gonna unpack this and, and take this um, a little bit slowly so we can unpack it. Um, here we're seeing that sleep disruption had the greatest relation in terms of impulsivity score among those who had low connectivity. So if the adolescent had low connectivity, they had high impulsivity scores if they were um, had high sleep disruption. The other frame is that the sleep, if they had good sleep, that was protective against what otherwise would be a strong relationship between um, connectivity and impulsivity. We became focused on what accounted for these individual differences and variation in the sleep disruption. And as I mentioned before, we had collected a lot of information about their sleep hygiene and their sleep context. What you're looking at on the right are some images we took from the various um, households we, we got to visit in Los Angeles. And if you know Los Angeles, you know that there's a wide disparity in, in socioeconomic status. Um, the image up on the right, on, on the top, is um, from a more uh, maybe middle income household, the one on the right, this kid had their whole wing to themselves in Beverly Hills, and so there was really a wide range. And um, we certainly looked at whether SES was associated with the sleep disruption score, and we didn't find that. Um, we looked at noise level, temperature, light, uh, pillow comfort, uh, how many people they shared a room with or a bed with. Some of these kids in particular had inconsistent sleep environments where sometimes they were in a different household, et cetera. And of course, technology. And we expected that technology would be the biggest uh, predictor or, or you know, the, the, the one that would account for most of the variance among um, sleep disruption metrics. And we didn't find that, and that, that surprised us because we assumed that those who were looking at the phone before bed were gonna have worse sleep. Um, I think the reason for that is because they were all looking at the phone before bed, and so there wasn't much variability there for us to, to get anything in, in, insightful from it. But what we did find is that pillow comfort was the most um, important uh, predictor of this relationship, so that those who were not just reporting, but showing with the actor graph the most sleep disruption were the ones who also, in a long battery of you know questionnaires and everything, told us that they their pillow was uncomfortable. And so um, we found this really fascinating because one, that's a relatively easy intervention that we can think about doing with young people. Um, two, we went back and asked the parents, well, did you know that, you know, Tommy has um, a crappy pillow? They're like, never taught, thought about it. You know, like, we, we, we just don't engage with our young people in that way about their sleep environment. But it makes perfect sense that if you are physically uncomfortable, you may not recognize that that's what's causing some of this greater um, awakenings during the night and then the longer awakenings. Um, and so anyway, so what we're doing now is uh, a study that started just before the pandemic, and of course that disrupted it, but um, you should, the lab has a lot of pillows, and you know kids can come in and choose their pillow, because I'm often asked, well, what's the optimal pillow? Well, that depends on you. Right? Some people don't, even, don't like a pillow. My daughter doesn't sleep with a pillow, and I can't stand it, but she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't want one. Um, but to determine whether or not there's, if we can match the optimal comfort level in terms of uh, bedding, might that um, it change, change what we're seeing in terms of the sleep awakenings and eventually the, the connectivity and impulsivity. Um, so one point I wanna make about this is that, and I hope I've, I've made, is that although sleep duration is really important, sleep variability is just as important, maybe even more so, because inconsistent sleep is obviously um, not as restful. Um, and to dig in a little bit to, um, to this, my graduate student, or my just recently graduated um, graduate student, Amanda, um, was interested in determining how, how um, sleep variation was associated with um, some other brain metrics. She focused in on a daily diary question that asked, how restful, how rested do I feel? From one, I'm so tired I wanna go back to bed, to I woke up feeling great and then she did um, a resting state scan as well. Here again, this is a, a whole new sample of participants. Um, they were also averaging a little over seven hours of night, so that was consistent with previous research, and these kids were followed over two weeks. And um, the average variability with these, with these um, participants was about 60 minutes a night, which meant that some kids were 
that's how much they varied over the two weeks and how much they went to bed. So this phenomenon is called sleep, um, it's called uh, social jet lag, whereby you, know, you, you don't get enough sleep maybe during the week and then at night or on the weekends you think that you can make up the sleep. And is the answer yes, you can make up the sleep? No, you obviously can't make up the sleep. We all think we can, but that doesn't actually happen. Unsurprisingly, she found that those with more variability um, over the two weeks uh, uh, reported feeling less, less restful, and, and, and that makes perfect sense, and that was really more of a, of a sanity check. Um, and she found that those who had um, uh, uh, more stressful demands on their time or, or perceived um, stress also showed less sleep duration. Again, not mind-blowing, but certainly um, gives us confidence that we're, we're picking up on some information that is reflective of their daily lives. What she did find using a path model um, analysis is that one additional demand was associated with a 10-minute reduction in sleep duration and a five-minute increase in sleep variability. And I point this out to note that, you know, sometimes parents will ask me, well, is my kid doing too much? It's like, well, yes, if you're asking the question, they're doing too much. But it certainly has, um, you know, what are seemingly small effects. But we know from our brain data that these, you know, 10-minute differences or 5-minute differences may have a greater impact on their, um, on the connectivity that we know is so essential to happen during this time. Um, and here are some data reflecting that sentiment, that as sleep duration increased, um, so those who are getting more sleep, um, connectivity between these regions that we know are really important for emotion regulation also increased. And so um, here, here again, in a separate sample, some, some relation between um, the importance of how long you're asleep or in bed and um, the normative changes we know need to happen during this time. We also found when we looked at sleep variability that there was dampened um, connectivity within the frontoparietal network in those who were getting more sleep variability, and in particular in the limbic network um, as associated with the frontal pole. And so all of this is to say that um, findings from the study suggest that although sleeping longer is beneficial for many adolescents, uh, these me benefits may be reduced if the cumulative sleep patterns become too variable. And so um, the consistency in sleep is just as important as how long that they are asleep. So I um, recently, if you're interested in, in the need for sleep and all the you know, more detailed um, um, discussion about sleep spindles and sleep and wake cycles and different um, you know, sleep, sleep patterns. Um, I encourage you to, to read these. These are really fun to write. It um, got me really um, you know, um, invested in, in the most recent research in sleep labs that are you know, quite challenging to do with adolescents, but that have given us a lot of information about um, the importance of quality sleep for supporting key developmental outcomes in adolescents. The last study I'll tell you about, obviously I'm very excited about sleep. The last thing I'll tell you about sleep is, um, you know, coming back to this question of why do we care about it, right? Because we know it's important for emotional health. We know it's important for cognitive development. But in coming back to what's important for adolescents and what things they're engaged in, one thing that adolescents do a lot of is start to learn to drive. This is an important skill. It's a scary thing for, for parents and adults. Um, and the reason for that is that car accidents are still the leading cause of death for, United, uh, for American adolescents. Um, obviously, sleep impacts driving of individuals of all ages. And we know that um, delaying school start time by an hour helps reduce the risk of car crashes by improving the sleep. In this study, we, we asked participants to do a task-based study um, using the the, the driving task that many of you are probably familiar with, it's one in which um, it aims to mimic the real life decision making that happens when you are driving and deciding whether or not to run a yellow light to get to the, to, to the end faster. Sometimes that leads to a car crash and sometimes it leads to more money in this study. What we found is that unsurprisingly, when participants were running the yellow light, in other words, taking the risky choice, they engaged or recruited um, neural systems that have been consistently associated with ris risky decision making, including the midbrain and mesolimbic systems, the amygdala, the caudate, the OFC. But here again, we found that um, there was a relation between brain activation and the association between poor sleep and the risky driving. So if you look at the image on the right, um, we've broken it up by sleep quality in terms of better sleep or worse sleep. 
and plotted this against their risk-taking behavior on this task as a function of their ventral striatal activation. And again, what we find is that the better sleep is protective against the, the risk-taking behavior um, among those who, uh, who show greater, you know, naturalistically greater activation of, of the ventral striatum. In the last few minutes, um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing at the Center for the Developing Adolescent, which I co-run with Andrew Fellini at, at UCLA. And this is more related to translating the science of adolescence into, into policy and in, into, um, into legal spaces and thinking about how we even talk about adolescence has implications for the way adolescents are treated, um, in particular in, 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 among system-impacted youth. Earlier, I mentioned that the um, journal Nature had a collection of articles in 2018 about adolescence. And one that really piqued my interest was an article called Adolescence Research Must Grow Up. Um, and if you can read it, what it says is that young people get a raw deal from society. Targeted study and approaches as part of a new global effort are urgently needed to help them. In other words, we need to stop you know, pathologizing adolescents and instead challenge stereotypes of young people. This second article is written by um, Eva Telzer and her group, and it aims to make um, the case that by challenging stereotypes and reframing adolescents as a window of opportunity, we may do better good and also help arm adolescents with um, a, a new narrative that is distinct from, from this. You know, we often see a lot of this. Um, adolescents are crazy that we need to get through the terrible teens, um, you know, teenagers are, are you know, behaving badly. Um, but this doesn't help understand adolescents, and it certainly doesn't help um, think about what their own developmental needs are. Another reason to reframe how we think about adolescence is that adolescence itself is changing. Um, this is a, a paper now a few years old that examined what what they, the authors considered characteristic adolescent behavior across successive generations. So um, it includes driving, uh, learning to drive, or getting a driver's license, trying alcohol, dating, and working for pay. In the mid-70s, these, um, the number of adolescents who endorsed these behaviors or said, yes, I do those things, was quite high, you know, 85 to 90 percent, particularly for the first three. And that was pretty steady state until the late 90s, when there was quite a drop in adolescents um, saying that they had obtained a driver's license, and in particular in California, actually, uh, trying alcohol, dating, or working for pay. Why might this have happened? The internet is one of them, right? So maybe they're not dating in real life, but they're dating somewhere else, right? That, that's one explanation. What else? The recession, mm-hmm. What else? Uber, legalization of marijuana, all of these things. And so this is just a reminder to consider that the way that we study adolescents also has to obviously evolve with, with the changing conditions and behaviors of contemporary adolescents. So one thing that um, cognitive neuroscience has helped us do, hopefully, and, and is continuing to do so, is to help us shift stereotypes about adolescence. So um, th the research I'll talk about is, is, are, are two um, main things related to learning and pro-social behavior. The learning study is one I did in collaboration with um, some colleagues at Columbia, Daphna Shohama, and her um, then graduate student, Juliet Davidow. Now, if you don't know Daphna, she is a researcher who studies memory, and she's very interested in learning behaviors that are uh, centralized in the striatum. So we study the same brain region, but she studies it from the learning perspective, and I study it from the reward perspective. So we were at a conference one day, and we started to say, well, you know what? Might it be the case that because adolescents show just greater engagement in the ventral striatum in response to reward, and we know that this striatum is also important for learning, might they be better than adults at learning from positive reinforcement or from rewarding stimuli simply because their, their striatal system is already kind of you know, in overdrive, as according to the previous data I had shown you before? And is there an advantage related to enhanced engagement of this learning system? 
Is it because adolescents are constantly learning new information? The changing social landscape, the changing cognitive landscape maybe requires them to have a, a, a more robust learning system. And the punchline is yes. The, the answer is that um, it, you know there was what we called an upside to reward sensitivity. That the, the negative frame is that greater reward sensitivity encourages you, encourages you to take maladaptive risks and to you know make suboptimal decisions. The, the, the other frame, the other side, is that there's an adapt, adaptive um, reason why we may have more greater might have greater reward sensitivity. So um, to study this, we, we asked participants to do a very simple learning task that Daphna had done with her adult participants to study learning. We made it a little more kid-friendly, whereby they were presented with these two flowers and said, you're going to see a butterfly, and you have to learn over time which flower the butterfly prefers. So over the course of the task or the experiment, they learned that this butterfly preferred the pink flower. Okay, it's a very simple task and, and people caught on quickly. They then received a reinforcement, whether that was correct or incorrect, and you can ignore this birdhouse for, for a minute. Um, and and that, was it, that was it, it was a simple test. What we found is that initially, the adolescents and the adults showed no difference in their learning accuracy. Both hovered around 65%. But by the end of the experiment, the adolescents outperformed the adults, whereby they were better at making the link between the flower and the butterfly. And this could be for a few reasons. It could be that they were paying more attention. It could be that they were more motivated by the money that we told them they would earn if they had a better learning accuracy. But when we took a look at the, at the, at the brain and the learning systems, we, we feel pretty confident from a lot of different data I'm not going to show you that um, the adolescents were showing greater um, activation in the, the learning systems, including in the hippocampus, which we know is um, more associated with long-term learning, and uh, the striatum was associated with this kind of um, cue and, and association, associative learning. And um, so both, in, in both of these regions, the adolescents had greater um, engagement than the adults, and we, um, we found that this was associated with their, with their behavior as well. With the birdhouse that you saw, I'm not going to show you the data, but we then tested them and asked whether or not um, the participants were better able to remember these random objects that they had seen with the, the positive or, or negative reinforcement, and only the adolescent group was better able to then say, oh yeah, I did see that birdhouse before, or, you know, some, some other kind of related question. Um, than the adults were, suggesting again that maybe this reward system helps um, solidify and cement that memory for the positive information. This research, um, you know, we published, and then um, Evelina Krona's group also published a very similar finding showing that in their adolescent group, those, um, the adolescents showed greater striatal activation compared to people of younger or older ages, and that this too also benefited some, you know, a separate learning task that they had done. And so the punchline for us is that there's, there is an adaptive nature, there's a necessary reason why the adolescent striatum or these reward systems um, show this distinction developmentally across the period of adolescence. It's not just helping them pay more attention to things they find pleasurable, like you know, hanging out with their friends or things like that, but it may also help them learn about the world in a way that's distinct from adults and um, younger kids. Um, the last thing I'll talk about are um, some recent data that there's a growing interest in understanding pro-social behavior. Um, our interest in it, and this is work I also do with Andrew, um, is in thinking about what is rewarding, what is a naturally rewarding uh, stimulus or behavior and pro-social behavior across, you know, you know, from a lot of adult research, um, shows that when we do something kind or, or beneficial for someone else, our reward systems light up, right? That it, it's, it's in some cases been associated with improved mental health, it's associated with skill building. Um, and by the way, pro-social behavior is defined as behavior that benefits others, such as giving or helping or, sh or sharing. Um, in, this, in this review, um, what you're seeing is, again, that um, 
despite what some people might think, pro-social behavior actually increases as people become adolescents. Who they exhibit pro-social behavior does change. They may not be showing as much pro-social behavior for you know, kids they don't know, but certainly with individuals they find uh, they feel close to, like their friends or their parents or their siblings, there's an increase in pro-social behavior. We also see this in terms of the activism that adolescents exhibit, whether it's about climate change or you know, racial injustice or so social justice. Adolescents are often at the forefront of this, and in, I think it's in part because the neural systems that support this pro-sociality -soci um, are, are showing this uptick. And indeed, um, Eva Telzer published, has published a few articles on um, pro-social behavior, and one she did in, a few years ago is, um, is one in which she asked participants to make choices about giving money to someone else while they were in the scanner versus keeping it for themselves. And sometimes that came at a cost. If they were giving it to someone and that would mean they lost that amount of money, then that was considered a costly giving um, choice. She also showed non-costly rewards where you get to keep the money or um, a, a you know, condition where they just shared the money equally. And the, the point here is to show that there were age differences in um, who gave the money, a costly giving behavior. And this was paralleled by age differences in the neural response to these rewards. So here I'm not focused in, or she didn't find um, more engagement in reward systems, but in what some call it, you know, the um, you know, perspective-taking brain systems or the social brain that involve um, regions of the temporal lobe and regions of the inferior frontal gyrus. And here again, there's this inverted U relationship with age. Okay, so I've thrown a lot of data at you, and I think I'll just close by asking um, and, and posing the question that I hope will engage in some conversation about what can we do better? We've learned a lot about the adolescent brain and developing brains in general using these cognitive tools, but what can we do to, to further increase um, how we support young people? And one is to invest in adolescence and adolescent research. Um, in the editorial of that same series of articles a few years ago, the, the editorial noted, a modern healthcare system without a focus on the unique challenges of pediatrics or geriatrics would be unthinkable, yet there is no similar effort on behalf of adolescents. And I think that's, that's striking, as there still isn't. Um, there are, of course, um, adolescent health, um, and, and, and mental health is certainly of concern, but of interest. Um, but, you know, we recently at the Center for the Developing Adolescent asked a consultant to look at, um, you know, in, in Congress or in, on the Hill, caucuses that are related to adolescents, just strictly typically developing adolescents, and there, there was not one. You know, there's a caucus for basically anything else you can think of. There's a caucus for horses, for example, we learned. But there's, a, there's no caucus focused strictly on um, the, the normative adolescent development phase of life, and I think that's, that's pretty striking. Um, that we can continue to use cognitive neuroscience to identify ideal points of intervention, and many of my conversations today we were talking about that. Like when we know that the brain is changing, there's a lot of plasticity during these you know, 15 or so years of life, we still don't have an answer despite all of our studies about when the ideal time for intervention for, for various different things um, would be, and I think that's, that's an area ripe for, for, for study. And finally, what I'll say is that I didn't talk much at mental health at all or social media use, but that very much comes up, uh, especially when I speak to parents or teachers. They want to know, well, is social media rotting the brain? And as a parent of an emerging teenager, I think about this a lot. Um, but I also think about the fact that by focusing, focusing um, exclusively on you know, the reactive nature of mental health and not thinking about um, what young people need to, to experience to boost their mental health may be a missed opportunity. Um, this is a, a recent comment Andrew and I wrote about how encouraging exploration and discovery regardless of, you know, typically developing or atypically developing, whatever that means for that individual would help boost mental health. Um, I already mentioned that helping others or pro-social behavior is one way that um, some, you know, minor pilot interventions have shown to, to support, uh, you know, as an ancillary um, outcome, mental health uh, outcomes. And um, in, in collaboration with Frameworks, and if you're not familiar, Frameworks is an organization that helps um, scientists reframe or um, think about how their messaging about their science gets 
translated or absorbed by the public in a way that is most effective. Um, Andrew and, and Nat, who's the, who leads Frameworks, wrote a really interesting article about how maybe focusing in on um, young people's mental health is obviously really important, but the st story that we're telling, the same doom and gloom without offering solutions, um, may actually be, be, be backfiring and, and create a condition where you know, the, the parallel they made was to climate change, that if you say so much that we're so doomed that it actually leads to the opposite effect that you want and people disengage because it seems so, um, so insurmountable. So with that, I will close and simply thank my lab and collaborators and funding sources and all of you for your attention and for the great discussion throughout the day. Thanks. This is such important and fascinating work. I really appreciate everything that you've done here. We talked a little bit earlier today about my work in autistic girls. Uh -huh. I'm now curious just about sex differences in adolescence. Mm -hmm. Take autism out of it. You know, there's evidence that males engage in more risky behavior mm -hmm. and things like this. Boys and girls are different yes. during adolescence as yes. well. Is there brain evidence also that you've uncovered and, and thought about? There is some. I mean, the data are mixed, and um, you know, Amanda probably knows more than I, than I do about this. But certainly, you know, in the work I look at with um, in the striatum, we certainly see brain differences in, in activation patterns. But it's it's challenging to say is it because there are just inherent brain differences, or it's because they do engage in more, let's say, physical risk taking behaviors that leads to greater activation. But um, anyway, that's what I know. But Amanda, do you have anything to offer? No. <laughs> we Just need no. to study more girls. We I need think, to study you know, more I, girls, yeah. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's true for a lot of things. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. And uh -huh. I'll be a little bit more patient with my teenage girls <laughs> when, I, when I go home. Yeah. Thank you. But I'm curious. So you talked about the, the relationship of busyness and sleep. And our yes. kids are very busy. And I'm wondering the difference between physical activity, busyness, and doing other things, like mm -hmm. spending your whole day playing video games mm -hmm. or studying. Do you see a difference in the physical activity in the relationship? That is so interesting. I don't, I don't know of any data examining that. I mean, I know there's, um, there's interest in understanding how just exercise and physical activity may be beneficial, but I haven't thought about or known any, any data on kind of the running aroundness that I think you're talking about versus the, um, you know, the, the, the non-physical aspect of busyness. But my guess is that cognitive load is cognitive load, and that's that's what this is associated with, right? All of us in this room are constantly task switching, and that's really taxing on our brains when we're trying to not just do too many things at once, but hold so many things in 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 mind. Um, and I suspect that's what's happening with young people as well. Um, there are some data that came out a few years ago showing that if that there are differences in the amount of sleep that is optimal based on whether you want to maximize academic performance or mental health. And unfortunately, those aren't the same. And so if you, uh, if the interest, not if the interest is, if the kids are prioritizing the academics, unsurprisingly, it's one hour less than if their mental health is optimized, which is an hour more. So that kind of speaks a little bit to how we, we prioritize and the messaging we give to our young people. So um, I wonder how much of, um, there's like a huge shift when we turn 18 and we've all socially arbitrarily determined that, you know, children sort of just become adults, mm -hmm. right? And so I wonder <laughs> how much of that data is reflected by, you know, you've hit 12th grade, you're graduating, okay, now you're off to work and all of these expectations that we have changed, yes. you know, we're no longer supported by our yes. parents as much, uh, we're, you know, our responsibilities change. Yes. Uh, there is not as much learning going on. Yeah. So our brains switch modes from learning mode to work mode. Yes. You know, and I wonder how much that might affect those scans. Yes. And the kinds of data you're getting. I have those very same questions. And, uh, you know, is it a coincidence that we think when the, the brain stops developing and starts aging is around the time that we have all these new responsibilities, right? And so it's right. really hard to disentangle. What if, what if we didn't have all of those responsibilities? Would the brain keep, um, you know, being plastic? Larry Steinberg, who's obviously, you know, really um, important for the field of adolescence, argues just that, that um, the age of what he calls the age of opportunity is expanding in, in more current generations as young people remain reliant financially, stay at home, or move back home because of, you know, things like the pandemic. Um, but I don't know of any systematic studies that have been able to, to disentangle that, but I think it's really interesting. It also, again, coming back to sleep, is that 
um, chronotypes, so whether you are more likely to be a night owl or an early bird, um, peaks at the end of adolescence. And that, unsurprisingly, you're more likely to be a night owl into adolescence. But I think that th those data are really confounded by the fact that then you have to get up for work. So it's not the case that you may choose that. It's just, it's just what happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. I yeah. appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks a lot for this talk. It was mm -hmm. really interesting. I, I'm interested in kind of a nuanced point that you made mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of your work has really gotten me thinking about um, adolescence and intellectual disability particularly. Mm -hmm. um, but you mentioned when you, when you showed the picture of the mm -hmm. eighth graders, yeah. you, you mentioned that age has, is not a very good proxy mm -hmm. of maturation mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering sort of what you think about what's better. Yeah. Um, especially like, you know, we're so torn, you know, in intellectual disability looking at, you know, do we use mental age? Do we use chronological age? What's yeah. the best way of getting at sort of functional and developmental levels? And I'm just interested in what your perspective is. On yeah, it's that. a really good question that I do think about a lot when, you know, I'm asked by a, a judge, like, does this person, should this, this person be tried as an adult or not? And age is the only proxy that we have. You know, some people talk about um, cognitive capacity, but then what is that? You know, how do we measure cognitive capacity or flexibility? So I don't have a good answer for you, but it is a really challenging one. I have a couple, well, a two-part question. Mm -hmm. So the first, for, you know, with your findings about sleep, mm -hmm. aside from we know that the pillow is important. Yes. Which is a good thing to think about. Yeah. I hadn't occurred to me. Mm -hmm. But um, aside from that, given the constraints that are... Mm -hmm systematic or, you know, that, that schools, especially as the kids get older, mm -hmm. actually tend to start earlier and earlier. Yes, right, yes. And we kind of have to adapt to that if our kids are in school. Yeah. Given that constraint, but then also the fact that the teen will not be as tired physically yes. and you can't really make them yes. sleep, I wonder if you have advice for parents on what we can do to, you know, to help the adolescent, given what we know about their sleep patterns. Yeah. And then... The second part is just if you have any, any take home for parents of teens, you know, like if you had like a couple bullet point things, how can we be more sympathetic and helpful to them? Yeah. Just from the breadth of, of all of this, these years of studying that you've done and yeah. that's really broad. But if you have any insight, yeah. it's, it's been great hearing you. The school start time is really challenging. Um, in 2014, the American Academy of Pediatrics made a recommendation that all schools should start an hour later. Well, that hasn't happened. I mean, it's happening in California, I think, soon. Um, and Seattle school systems have done a great job at that, and they have seen some gains in terms of things like academic performance and SAT scores to uh, decreasing car crashes. Um, so that that does seem to show some some benefits of doing that. but. The, the, the resistance to it is because we live in an adult world. And so what happens to parents who have to go to work and things like that. You know, one thing that's been discussed um, and I think is a good idea is to shift what topics or, uh, you know, course topics are taught early in the morning. So maybe don't start with writing and math, but start with PE, coming back to the physical activity or things that are not going to be as cognitively related to how well you slept the previous night. But... I don't know of any efforts to do that. Um, in terms of how old are your kids, teenagers? I mean, I have a nine-year-old who acts like a teenager. <laughs> we all do. Yeah. I think um, engaging with them on these issues now is really important. The, you know, the establishing a good sleep hygiene in the same way that we try to establish good food habits. Um, sleep habits are really important. Um, having conversations about, and I know I'm stating the obvious, but truly having conversations about the romantic relationships that I was talking about, the puberty, I took my kids to see Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, on, on Sunday, on Mother's Day. And my nine-year-old, she was like this, but like, you know, like she was so curious, but she almost felt like she shouldn't be yet or something like that. And so that helped establish a context to have conversations that she may otherwise have felt uncomfortable about. So um, just things like that. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. 
Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.